So I'm going to start the second panel. Those who have something to say, go outside. Shh. Okay. And don't forget your books. All these panelists uh, have uh, books of some nature. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, Professor Anita Hill. Uh, October will be the 20th anniversary of our uh, dreaded days in Washington, D.C. on October uh, 1991. And the topic is race and media. It's, and this means race and gender in media. Your sense about, I don't know if you saw the videos, we showed some videos, but your sense about whether or not how the media, and that we were, Gwen will tell you there's a difference between journalists and media, and Tim knows that as well. Your sense about the press's treatment of the issues of gender and religion and race, uh, what's your sense about it? Fair, unfair? My sense is that part of the problem is um, that, okay, I will speak right into the microphone. There you go. Um, that got their attention. My, my, I think part of the problem is that it is hard for the press to cover uh, the various dimensions of race that when we, when we see stories about race, like the tapes you played, they, they tend to be one-dimensional coverage. That we, that, it, that, it, that sort of lapses, even when you're talking about mainstream media or whether you're talking about journalism, it sort of lapses into caricatures of race. And what I, I say happened during the hearings uh, was that only one of us could have a race. And so Clarence Thomas was the person with the race. And then, of course, then only one of us could have a gender, <laughs> and that I became the person who had a gender. And they, and as far as I know, at least, most of us come with both. Uh, race and gender. And it's hard for the press to understand that and, and understand what that means. And that we're going to experience race differently and gender differently. And, and I think that was probably, um, I think, one of the most disheartening things that occurred in terms of the coverage of the hearings. It was as though I became deracialized uh, because they couldn't see me both as a woman and an African American. And I still see that happening today. Um, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, once one uh, recent, more recent, is a coverage of, in the New York Times of uh, black migration, reverse migration, out of urban areas back to the South where generations had been before. And uh, it was a story, but even in the story, most of the individuals featured were African American women. Um, and I went, I actually called up the researchers who had I contributed to the story, and I asked them, what are the gender dynamics of this phenomenon? And what they said was, well, in fact, many of the people who are repatriating are, in fact, African-American women. A majority of them are African-American women. A majority of them are young, and they're educated. And they're better educated. And that has implications. Uh, that have to do with race and gender and class, but that doesn't get covered in the news. And so you don't really get a full story of what is going on with uh, us and our issues. And I, I, so I think it's perhaps uh, improving, the coverage is improving, maybe some issues are being discussed. Um, when we talk about the recession, we, have, we don't necessarily break down the issues in terms of gender, uh, the impact of unemployment in terms of gender or, or, or race, 
And we certainly don't do it in terms of both. And so I don't know that we've really advanced that far. Let me ask uh, you. From my situation. We, we don't have it here, but you just completed another phenomenal book. You want to say a word about the new book? Well, um, it, 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 it sort of came to mind. The title of the book is Reimagining Equality. And it really uh, tries to address some of the structural differences or stru structural difficulties that we have in achieving equality in this country. Uh, I, I, and I will only say this about it, um, that in terms of the achievement of the American dream through home ownership, uh, what I believe has happened is in fact that we have we're, we're putting ourselves as African Americans and as women in almost an impossible position. Uh, that our ability to achieve the American dream as it's been articulated is diminishing. It's not increasing as we had hoped it would be, as our parents had hoped it would be for their children. And that we are going, to, we're in a cycle now where we're going to have to rethink what the dream is and we rethink what um, the responsibility for, of our government is for helping us achieve it. Thank you. Tim Weiss, let me ask you this. You've been very courageous. I don't know many people other than Frederick Douglass who really talk about white people <laughs> in such plain, <laughs> clear language. <laughs> Uh, and live to uh, get praise for it. So what are you trying to achieve? You know, the press every day is on issues of race and, and, and how the media treats it. What are you trying to interject in there to give a different dialogue? And do you think it's working? Uh, well, now that I've been put in the category of Frederick Douglass, I'm just going <laughs> to... You can use that as next book. <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, soak in the white privilege that allowed me to get that. <laughs> Happily. Um, you know, here, here's the thing. I, uh, I don't know that it's, that it's really all that courageous um, for me or, or for white folks who call out white racism, uh, white supremacy, not white people. White folks sometimes have difficulty distinguishing between whiteness as a system and them. And so if you critique whiteness or you critique white supremacy, a lot of white folks think you hate white people. And uh, I actually, uh, I, I love me some white people. <laughs> uh, my, my wife and, uh, and, and our two girls, that sometimes, sometimes happens when white people have babies. They're, they're also white and we love them. Uh, but I don't know that it's, that it's courageous. I think it is... And to whatever extent it is, the courage that it takes to do it really sort of pales in comparison to that which folks of color have always had to exhibit just to get up every day, walk out the door, and do whatever it is they have to do in order to maintain and survive. And so it really is incumbent upon those of us who are white to suck it up, whatever fear we have about talking about race, and realize that it's really a fraction of the difficulty. Now, now the fact that we can challenge racism, though, doesn't automatically tell us how we ought to do it and what that looks like. And I think that's the difficult part. That's the part that, that I try, uh, however I can, to, to figure out. And I think it is made difficult by, going back to what Professor Hill said, about this sort of one-dimensional nature of the way media discusses the issue. So whether it's conflating race and gender and, and sublimating one into the other so that you don't see both, or whether it's you know the way that I'm uh, interviewed when I, on those occasions when I get to be on uh, CNN. Uh, Don Lemon will bring me on. I love Don dearly. Wonderful, wonderful guy and, and tries to do a very good job at CNN talking about a lot of these issues. When he has me on, uh, you know, he is still under that same pressure to do this in a six minute segment. And that means if we're talking about the Tea Party or we're talking about, you know, outrage at health care reform uh, on the part of people who will proudly tell you they would rather not have health care than have the government pay for it. Um, <laughs> uh, 
inevitably the question will be as follows. It will, it will sound something like this. Tim is the Tea Party racist. Go. <laughs> you know. And um, that makes, you know, you can do that in five or six minutes, I suppose, if you want really easy answers, right? Mm -hmm. So the simplistic answer is, I mean, I, I've been white a long time. Um, uh, will be 43 years in October. I've been white long enough to know that when white folks older than me say they want their country back, that scares the hell out of me. Because I know, <laughs> because I know, you know, I know what their country was, and so do they, and that's the point. Um, but I, I can't just give that answer and feel good about it, to say, well, of course, of course, it's race and it's racial resentment, because, of course, it's a, it's a bit more complicated than that. You know, what I think the media sometimes misses, because it takes a while to make the argument, but I'll make it very briefly, is this. I think that what we're seeing, for instance, with the Tea Party, what we're seeing with, with uh, uh, right-wing reaction to a lot of things, not just a black president, an economic meltdown that's hitting white folks for the first time in about 75 years in the way that it is. White folks have not had double digit unemployment staring us in the face since the Great Depression. Black and brown folks, that's not new. White folks, that's pretty new. Um, and so when you add that, that adds to anxiety and fear and resentment when you take a, a popular culture that's thoroughly multicultural now in ways that it wasn't, you know, even 24, 25 years ago, MTV wouldn't play videos by black artists. Michael Jackson was the first and for a while the only. Now we are a thoroughly multicultural pop culture. There are some folks who can't, can't deal with looking out at the pop culture icons and they don't look like them, you know? They, they, it's not from their neighborhood. And then there's the fourth factor, the sort of demographic shift, which is within 30 years gonna render this country mostly people of color. All of those things, right, are this sort of perfect storm of white anxiety. And when you have a discussion, as we did with healthcare, about government policy to help the have-nots, or the have-lessers in the case of healthcare. Um, we have had 40 years of socialization as a society, at least 40 years, where whenever we talk about policies to help the have-nots and have-lessers, we hear black people and increasingly brown folks. So we hear black and Latino. That is what, and study after study suggests that. That is what people are hearing so that we can't even have a conversation about some of the economic reforms, public policy, social policy, unless we're prepared to talk about race, because that is at the heart of this fear, this resentment, this idea that if we help those people, they will abuse whatever program it is that we're going to create for them. And the irony of this, and this is how I think we can potentially break through, uh, as, as was being said in the last panel, how do we connect this to economics? It's by getting folks to understand now, perhaps the best opportunity for us to do it, that black and brown pain around inadequate health care, black and brown pain around double digit unemployment, foreclosures, etc., is now become white pain. And that is to say that when the foreclosure crisis began, it wasn't six years ago, it wasn't five years ago, it was in the early 1990s when predatory lenders were going into black and brown neighborhoods and ripping folks off and no one paid attention to it. White folks didn't pay attention to it because they didn't have to. And now I think we have an opportunity to begin saying, you know, the rot that you ignore, because it's on the other side of town, the economic rot, the social decay, the problem that you do not pay attention to today, wait 10 years, wait 15 years, wait 20 years, and it will be at your doorstep. This is an opportunity, but you see, that doesn't fit in a six minute clip on CNN where they got five guests and it's boom, boom, boom. So we have to really think about how to make that message resonate not only in our communities, but in, in the media. Thank you very much. <laughs> Howard Manley, I want to talk to you about what, what you're doing now. You work for the Daily News, you work for the Boston Globe, the Boston Herald, and now the executive editor of the Bay State Banner. We talk about race in the media. Uh, it seems that the Banner's focus is on race. It covers a lot of different areas, not crime and other things like that, but you pick up the banner every Wednesday uh, and it has something about somebody and you're trying to do two things. One is current events, but this remarkable sense M Mandela had a birthday or this is the anniversary of, you know, what happened uh, in uh, uh, Scottsboro. I mean, that sort of education as well. So what are you trying to capture? Because you're focusing on, even though su subscribers are of many races, you're focusing on what's happening in the black community locally nationally and sometimes globally. What are you trying to do? 
Well, I, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, uh, having me here. Uh, as a representative of the black press, uh, it's always good to be around big time folks and uh, who are trying to get, uh, because we don't have any problem at the black press, the ones that are surviving and doing well, of being angry or being historically accurate or providing information that we think ultimately, yes, is going to be a, a truthful, but is it helpful? And so at the banner, and listening to some of these uh, 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 dis, uh, misinterpretations of black folks is nothing really new and we're not shouldn't be surprised that those mistakes come up from time to time and in, in fact given the, the way the technology is they come up more often than not and so if you look at the history of the black press it started with this fundamental issue for so long others have told our story and that was in 1827 and when you look at that paper and the two people that ran it, one was John Roosworm, one of the first guys to graduate from college in America, and the other was uh, Sam Cornish. He was sort of a preacher's son. And the battle, the paper only lasted for two years. So this issue about advertising and all that, we the black press, we will find a way to survive. That's what we do. That's what we, you so their split was Cornish wanted folks to go to school and do the Booker T. Washington thing and, 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 and work hard and don't get arrested and don't be drunk in public and all that. But Roos Warren, he, he, he just, you know what? They're never going to get it. They're just not. So he moves to Africa. So that split is still present today. And when you look at the black papers across the country, we're losing the battle because they are entertainment. They are cultural. They're totally dependent on the ads. I saw a paper in uh, New Haven the other day, had a front page ad advertising the movie The Help. Now, I don't know how many people have seen that, but that will never be in the banner on the front page. I can tell you that much right now, <laughs> ever. And so one of the things that we try to do is we try to keep up, and you gotta remember, we're a small community newspaper. Nobody knew at, that Deval Patrick would become governor so now we have to cover him just because. <laughs> and then Barack Obama comes up. Now we don't, we didn't even have a state house bureau. Now we got to cover the White House <laughs> on Mel Miller's budget, which is zero. <laughs> so we have an inordinate challenge, given the internet, the, the cycle of nanoseconds and all this stuff, to try to do something that makes people stop, think, and read. So we go uh, maybe a little bit too much on why are we here. So we'll trace it not just back to the 60s, but we'll go back on you. We'll go back to Monroe Trotter, who started the paper and had no problem confronting the president about racist policy. He had no issue being angry. The Chicago Defender was all good. And when you look at these papers now, you go, <sighs> So we, and this is what I will say about Boston, and I'll get it back to the Freedom's Journal, the first black paper. There were a group of businessmen in Boston, a preacher and, and David Walker, one of the first uh, uh, militants, uh, raised a little money and helped this paper start out. And that's what happened when the banner, when we folded, it wasn't a whole bunch of folks coming in with corporate dollars and we'll help you. It was folks like Charles Ogletree, Wayne Budd, stepped up, said, we hit his little money, y'all keep on doing what you're doing. We're not, for us, it's not about the money. It's about the statement. Thank you. <laughs> Tiffany Manuel, you've been doing a lot of research on this, the whole issue with frameworks, and what are you finding? What, what, what is it that we need to know about the issue of race in the media, or race in general, uh, it, it seems like a very complicated, difficult, and maybe even impossible discussion to have uh, among people of different races. What's Framework's point of view and what are you trying to do with the Institute? Sure. So I work for the Frameworks Institute, which, which is an institute that tries to look at the solutions to how we begin to have the conversation about race in a more constructive way. So we already know that the current racial discussion is incredibly dysfunctional. So it becomes a discussion about, if we look at the, at the, at the Henry Louis Gates um, uh, tape, it becomes an issue about um, a myopic discussion about races uh, and police 
And, and if the media, right, and if we allow that story to be framed in that way, it totally undermines kind of the larger and broader issues that we need to have a conversation about. So, uh, and, and, and I think what's, what's really interesting to me is the way in which we have lost ground on the issue of culture. What is, what is impacting that discussion is the way in which we have learned culturally to tell certain kinds of stories. So we know how to tell the crisis story really well. We know how to tell the, uh, it's all about the economy story really well, but we don't know how to tell social justice stories in a way that bring people in. And I gotta say that th that, that story has become more complicated. So it used to be when you were watching the 60s, when you were watching the news, you could see just the, the, the visceral nature of the violence that was happening. So even if you were not totally connected to the message of what King had to say and others had to say, just watching the kind of violence and inhumanity that would draw you in. So you got kids pouring in to the South just because, in part, of what they were seeing. And I think what we have now is a very different set of circumstances. The kind of violence that is now being projected is not as visceral, it's not as visible. So you got the violence that happens in prisons that is off to the side that has been Right, so that people don't have the chance to see. You also have residential segregation, so you have poor communities where there is enormous amounts of violence in the way that you might have seen in the 1960s, but that's, that, as, as you were saying, Tim, is over in the corner across the track. So the, the majority of the population, even some of our own children who are not in those communities, don't get a chance to see that. So if you wanna bring in people to the social justice concerns, you've got to structure that message very differently than the way we've been doing, and, and we haven't done a good job of that. And so part of what we've been doing at the Institute is really to try and figure out how you begin to have that conversation in a way that is a lot more productive. And the funny thing about that to me is that people actually do want to have the race conversation, they just don't know how to, how to do it. And a part of it is because for, for a lot of us, the, the, the ticket for admission into that conversation is I've got to say that I've done something wrong or people who look like me have done something wrong. And if that is the price of admission, they're not willing to play. Let me, let me ask you a follow-up question to that because I when President Clinton had uh, our dear mentor, uh, John Hope Franklin, uh, ha have this race discussion in the 1990s. I, I wrote an op-ed about it, and my concern was, Mr. President, if you're going to have a discussion about race, you can't get people to open up unless you're going to be there to suture the injuries. That, if people talk about all the frustration and pain and racism, is something going to be done about it? And, and sort of, it, it never actually happened. We really haven't had that discussion now. And I guess my question is, you seem to be suggesting we can have it, which means I can say if I'm white and southern and poor, I could say what I feel about you people, uh, and that's a start in the process of moving forward. If I'm black and profiled by police or think I'm profiled by police and always stopped in department stores, can I be honest about my sense about race and about the, the law enforcement? What are you saying? Can everybody really have a discussion that's going to move us forward, or is that impossible or impractical? So, so, so not only do I know that's possible, but, but part of the work of the Institute is to, is to demonstrate that through the, through the research. So, so the, the good thing about that is there's about 30 years of really interesting research coming out of cognitive and social sciences about how you begin to have that conversation that looks at sort of cultural models, but also look at the, the, the sort of the, the way in which you can in, in, interact with those cultural models in ways that get people up and over their, their predilection. So the way you get up and over this oppositional conversation about us versus them. So if I, so if I say that I want health care, it's really about helping them versus me. I'm out of that game. So, so, so I, there are ways to do that. And I think, you know, the, the challenge for us is being willing to open up as, as advocates for issues of sort of racial equality to open up and, and to use that research. And I want to say that the, that the conservative right uses that research incredibly well and incredibly tactically, right? So, so they have learned to use, so when they, be, so when they come on CNN, and they, and they drop something like, or they're talking about immigration, and they drop something like um, uh, 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 baby anchors when they're talking about immigration. Anchor babies. Anchor babies, right? When they drop that, it's not that because they thought of that sort of in the middle of the night and it was kind of an interesting thing to say. There is, there is something about the way you drop those metaphors in the conversation that changes the shape of the conversation and that changes the shape of your thinking. And we on the other side of the, cons uh, of the, of the, of the table have not done the research to do the same thing. What are the metaphors that help people 
people understand race very differently, right? So talking about structures of opportunity sort of doesn't, doesn't sound very sexy, right, in the way that, that, that the conservatives have been able to do. And so um, we, we've got to become more strategic. We've got to become more tactical. And it's really interesting. When I looked at the, we were watching some of the, the video clips of Martin Luther King and some of the, the 60s March movement, there was, I mean, the, 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 the strategy was just amazing. I mean, even looking at the way in which the people were dressed when they were marching, right? So they weren't coming to town in sort of baggy jeans, and there's nothing against baggy jeans, right? Right? <laughs> right? But, 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 but they were told and instructed to come in their Sunday best. Now, you got to remember, these people were marching, and, you know, and so some of you don't have to remember because you were there, but, you know, these folks were marching in, you know, 80, 90, 100 degree heat. The women had heels, Sunday dresses, uh, 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 pocketbooks, right? Mm -hmm. On, and and, and, and it, that was strategic. It was not just so that people would think they were really interesting and really dressed really well. They understood that there was a discourse that dehumanized them, that, that people understood them as dirty, that people thought that they could not be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, upstanding citizens. And so they were making a statement that was not only about the visual presentation, but was changing the shape of how people understood who they were. And I think we have got to do the same thing. We have, we have missed that, and we've got to get back to that. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Kennedy, you, you've been uh, teaching for uh, almost three decades now and, and impacting a lot of thought among a very diverse group of uh, law graduates about what they're going to do, written half a dozen books about different aspects of race. Your latest book uh, is very interesting, and I hope people will get it today, uh, not only in the sense that you talk about race, but you talk about Obama, but one of the most risky uh, yet very successful chapters is uh, you talking about your father and Jeremiah Wright. Uh, and how do you put those two in the same sentence? Uh, but you did in a very powerful uh, a chapter, uh, which makes me think that you're trying to talk about race in some way. You're trying to make people see these folks in a different light, not what they saw in a clip in the news in 2008 or what they heard uh, in Detroit at the NAACP speech or uh, at the National Press Club. You sort of humanize this person. So your sense, what are you trying to do to make this conversation about race more accessible, to everyone, uh, and, and, and you write about it a lot, what, what should we be learning about race that we really haven't uh, yet been willing to accept? Well, let me say a little bit about that particular chapter in my book, because there was a chapter that concerned me a lot. I was uh, very worried about the reception. So I've just written a book called The Persistence of the Color Line, Racial Politics in the Obama Presidency. And it talks about all of the various racial controversies that attended uh, the election of 2008 and that have uh, attended the, uh, uh, the presidency of Barack Obama, all the various controversies. But in the middle of the book, I talked about the question of patriotism because, of course, one of the most, um, one of the most dangerous phases of the election campaign of 2008 occurred over with respect to uh, then candidate Obama's relationship with uh, his former pastor, Jeremiah Wright. Wright. And um, a lot of people, a lot of people were extremely critical of Jeremiah Wright. And people, and there were some people who said, you know, how could he say such things? I mean, you know, goddamn America. Uh, you know, how, how could he be this angry? And how could he be this dismissive to the United States? And how could he be so vengeful? And, uh, and they associated his views and sentiments with the president's. And after all, the president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. And you know, you've got to have somebody in there who you think is going to be on the side of the United States. So this posed a tremendous problem for Barack Obama. And for me, as I was witnessing that, I viewed it from a somewhat different angle, I think, because of uh, my father. Uh, my father was from uh, uh, Louisiana, born in 1917. A wonderful man, loving man, very intelligent man, never finished college, but read a whole lot, very thoughtful. And during the whole controversy with the Reverend Wright, I was thinking of my father. My father died about 10 years ago. 
And my father was much more extreme <laughs> than Reverend Wright. Um, my father, I mean, you know, on the, on the patriotism question, um, my father was not patriotic. In fact, he was anti-patriotic. He never forgave the United States for what he viewed as a betrayal of himself and a betrayal of those who he loved most. He never forgave the United States. I once asked my, t my dad, I said, well, you enlisted in the army in, in, in 1940, you know, why'd you do that? And without missing a beat, he looked at me and he said, to eat. <laughs> <laughs> there was no talk about you know, service to the country or anything. It was, it was, it was very straightforward. <laughs> and we talked about this a good bit. And what I wanted to do in that chapter was uh, do a couple things. Number one, I think the whole Reverend Wright episode did show the way in which, with respect to matters of race, uh, learning is our, our, our knowledge base is so varied. I mean, you know, from my perspective, it, it should not have been a surprise to anyone that there would be people who had Reverend Wright's positions. I mean, you know, I mean, most black people I talk with, whether they agreed with him or not, they knew where he was coming from. They had heard this before. I mean, come on. Um, but then there were a lot of other people, you know, can you believe what he said? What do you mean, can you believe what he said? And then with respect to the substance of what he said, with respect to the substance of what he said, and here the media, I mean, you know, there are a lot of people, including a lot of journalists and commentators, who acted as if it was somehow sacrilegious what he said. Well, I mean, you know, in the history of the United States, have there been other people who are thoughtful people, who people deeply respect, who have talked about the issue of God and his relationship to the United States and whether the United States would be damned? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson from the Commonwealth. <laughs> See, I, I didn't go there, Governor Wilder. Tom See, it's not me. <laughs> what, did, what did Thomas Jefferson say? What did Thomas Jefferson say at the founding of the nation? He said that he trembled at the idea that God was just. Because if God was just, the new republic would be in trouble. What about Abraham Lincoln? I mean, Abraham, everybody's talking about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln talked. Gettysburg Address, second inaugural, first inaugural. He was constantly talking about the judgment of God before the United States, God's judgment of the United States, given the terribleness of human bondage. Uh, and one could go on and on and on. So. What I wanted to do in the chapter was, sim was a, a couple of different things. Uh, I'm very critical, and I make this clear, I'm critical of various positions that Reverend Wright took. But I wanted people to understand why he was taking the position that he took, and that it was not a crazy position. You might disagree with it, but it was not crazy. In fact, the position he was taking has a long tradition, certainly within the black community. And he was voicing ideas that not only should be heard, but that actually should be appreciated. And instead of people you know, damning him, what people ought to be doing is reforming the society in a way that would answer some of the, some of the indictment that he rightfully applied to our society. Thank you. <clears throat> We're nearing the end. I want, want to go to uh, Governor Wilder and Gwen Eiffel to start with this question and others can respond. Uh, and it's what we're here for. And the question is, uh, your point of view, can we really have the conversation, and there's more than one, the conversation about race that is, are we ready? Do we need to be ready? Can we have the conversation about race? Black, white, rich, poor, southern, northern. Can we have the conversation, Governor? And you're in a state where it made a difference. Well, first I want to say that uh, my good friend Randall 
Kennedy is absolutely right. There's no more hypocritical treatises uh, that exist than, in many instances, the words of Thomas Jefferson, an American hero. But we in Virginia knew what he did. <laughs> he paid very little attention to what he said. And in that regard, but it helped me a great deal. It helped me more than you could imagine. Because as a, a young boy, and being forced to learn and read the words of the Declaration of Independence, and when I got to that point and my great aunt would force us all to participate in the civil teas, silver teas, some of these people are too Young to know what that meant. That meant you passed a basket and put something in it other than uh, pennies. You put nickels and dimes when they were performing to have their little cultural performances. And so when you're called upon to learn the words to the Declaration of Independence, when you get to that part that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So I asked my mother, I said, what does that word mean? Inalienable. She said, it means no one can take it from you. I said, does that mean me? She said, yes. Well, it was too late then because there was nothing anyone else could ever tell me because my mother told me I could be anything I wanted to be, anywhere I wanted to be. And so I've been learning a lot sitting here this evening, this afternoon, because when we talk about can we start this conversation on race, can we deal with the media on race, how do we deal with the politicians and race? And I think we've all agreed to it, and we said something about it yesterday in having the opportunity to address the Road Scholars Program, some of what we were talking about here today. And our speakers here have already agreed to it. Education is the key. But why do you start with education? With home first, then the community second, and then in the schools. You're not going to teach people after they have gotten grown about their country? <laughs> when they were born on a country that they've told was racist? and divided, and they've fixed in their minds the proximities of how they're going to deal with that, in terms of having then Tim Wise to come and say, well, all of us are not crazy, <laughs> that all of us recognize the realities of what takes place. That's why I couldn't wait to get up here uh, this week to see my friend Randall and to tell him I needed to get a bunch of copies of his book because I'm teaching at Virginia Commonwealth University in Virginia, in the School of Government and Public Policy. My students will have this next week. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not asking them to agree with him or me. And by the same token, we discuss what we call public policy challenges. Everything that's, as they would say, awfully vast or elegantly little. But we will talk about it. If it's raised, let's hear how you feel about it. It's amazing, though, Tree, when you see these kids come in, and not all just kids, they'll start the semester off one way, and I don't have to tell this to these professors who, who are here. Their minds are so fixed, they know what they're going to do. Midway through, they've heard someone else say something in the class. Somewhat later, they've read something else. They are not the same persons when they finish that class when they come there. Why? Because they have been educated. And what I hope we can do is to encourage our churches, our communities, our schools, our parents, and at home to work together to educate America about race. Thank you very much. When I folk, can we have this conversation, honestly? I'm glad you called on me last because I, I get to put on my moderator hat and distill this incredibly interesting conversation we've had because it gets to the answer to your question. 
When Tim Wise talks about how white people see race, when in fact most many white people I know don't see themselves as a being of any race at all, they see themselves as, as us as being a race and themselves as being normal. <laughs> Tiffany, who talks about how anxious we are to talk about it, but points out correctly that other people have figured out the dog whistle politics of this, how to use research to send a message without actually saying it, like taking our country back, and that how many people who are liberals aren't equipped to do it the same way. Doug Wilder, who not only through practice in being elected the first black governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, but also now on the other end of his career teaching children, young people, how to see it is dealing with the complexities not only of the practical nature of politics, but also the practical nature of educating our children to understand the layers that we are dealing with. Anita Hill, who correctly points out that you are one or the other, but people don't know how to deal with you or if you are both, or maybe three or four things. Randy Kennedy, who manages to sit here and say something that we all know to be true, which is, which but somehow politically was never saleable in the media about what Jeremiah Wright said, about what he did, but that the politics of it were that the president, now president, then candidate Obama was never in a position to defend it. And the only question was why it took him so long to denounce it in the end, because that's how complicated our conversation is. And Howard Manley, who speaks of the unique role, which we had a question at the end of the last panel about the black press and how someone has to be the exhorting voice out here to get to the bottom of it all. But at the, but at the root of it all, once you look at this complicated conversation, is the answer to the question about why the media is almost the worst place to have this conversation. As conversations have gotten more complicated, we've gotten more dumbed down, to be quite honest. Uh, we have split into a million different shards of media which means that everybody in every little corner and every little website, with every little blog, with every little tweet, Charles, is able. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> is able to express what they believe, but not necessarily what is true. And 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 we fall down. We who are actually legitimate journalists fall down on the job in not knowing how to tackle the complicated. It's not. It's not just whether it's the complicated about race. It's the complicated about any issue in which we all agree, don't agree, which is to say almost every issue. So the solution, I believe, is to watch PBS. <laughs> Professor Hill, then a final comment from Tim Wise. I've got a question for you, Tim. Go ahead. I, uh, one of the things that I would like to say, though, is that when we talk about race is really key. Um, we have these three clips you saw earlier, and each one of them you know, brought us to a conversation about race. Uh, but I'll give you an example of some things that should have ha had us talking about race, but we didn't talk about race. Um, over the years, and we all know about it, since Columbine, since uh, any number of the school shooting incidents, we have had white, young white males doing school shootings, engaged in violent acts, but we never engaged in a conversation about their race and what that meant, what race meant in that context of white male violence. We didn't have that conversation. And the only time the conversation even turned to race was when we had an Asian American who was the school shooter. So, the, so, so there's a question about when we talk about race and if that burden is always going to be put on people of color to bring us to the conversation of race, then no, we're not ready to have it. We're not ready to have it. We're not there yet. And uh, Tim, I, I know you speak on behalf of all white people. <laughs> so I wanted you to have the last word for a rebuttal or an endorsement uh, of that. Well, a rebuttal of Professor Hill or the fact General. that you speak for all white people. Uh, you do! Uh, well, I don't think they want me to speak, it, but um, uh, that card is going to be pulled, I'm sure, anyway. Um, I, I agree completely with, uh, with Professor Hill. I think that... Um, and, and that last point that she made about the, the both, I think, the ethical implication and the practical implication of having this conversation always rest on the shoulders of black and brown folk. 
is the one that every white person in this room, and I see you, you're out there, I know you're <laughs> um, uh, We all look very similar, but I, uh, I, can, I can differentiate, because uh, um, we are going to have to stop being voyeurs in this conversation, which is what we do. We come to events like this, and I don't mean to criticize anyone who's come. It's wonderful that you're here. You could have done a lot of other things. The weather's nice today. I know it hasn't been. You're here. That's wonderful. But what we do is we come, we watch the clips, as we did earlier. Uh, we talk about racial injustice. And for many of us, um, that's how we sort of get our liberal on. You know, that's how we sort of, <laughs> sort of get, our, get, our, uh, uh, get our progressive brownie points for, you know, the week or the month or whatever. And, and we, you know, sort of cluck our tongues and we say, this is terrible, oh my God, this is awful, you know, what happened to, to Professor Gates, and it's awful what, you know, that, that uh, television station did to that little four-year-old, you know, taking his comments out of context in Chicago. But yet what we do when we do that is we are relying on, and we're asking other white folks, really to, to rely on their altruism and their good intentions to end racism from our side of things. And that isn't going to get it done. We're going to have to start coming into this conversation, not as voyeurs sitting back taking notes as the black and brown folks say very interesting things. Well, that's fascinating. Wow, that's terrible. That's awful. Or that's crazy, as many said with regard to Reverend Wright. But it's always voyeuristic. We are not being honest. And in particular, we're not being honest about our racialized experience. So it goes to what Gwen is saying when she says, you know, that white folks don't even think they have a race, they're just normal. You know, I'm not white, I'm Bob. You know, what the hell does that mean? But that is where, you know, we're not being honest. We're, we, so we're going to have to stop lying. And, 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 in, and not only about our history, but about our lives. So when we see the clip about about Henry Louis Gates. I mean, I wrote about that right after it happened, and one of the things that I talked about wasn't enough for me to condemn what happened to him or to throw out data on racial profiling, which I could easily do, and I did, but that wasn't sufficient. I had to talk about my experience with law enforcement and how utterly opposite it is from that experience. Because if I'm not honest about that, then other white folks don't think that they're implicated in this thing. It's just racism is what happens to people of color, and I'm just watching it. But racism is most decidedly not what is happening to me. So when I'm 23 years old in the city of New Orleans, breaking into a car, my own, mind you, because I had locked myself out. So I'm trying to get in with a wire hanger. And I'm, I used to be good at this. I used to work sacking groceries when I was 16. I had to let people into their cars. So I was good at breaking into cars. Um, I probably, uh, statute of limitations has expired on all that. So. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm out there trying to get into my car, a New Orleans police officer, uh, if I have to tell you anything else, you're obviously not paying attention. That's all you need to know. A New Orleans police officer comes upon me breaking into a car that he has no reason to believe is mine, right? I'm 23, I'm white, I I'm, I'm, hadn't shaved in like three days, I look like hell, uh, you know, uh, wearing cut-off shorts and t-shirt. He comes up to me, not only does he not ask me for proof that it's my car, not only does he not ask me for registration or license or any identification, he says, and this is a direct quote, you're doing that the wrong way. <laughs> and he proceeds to advise me on the proper method for automotive theft and breaking into a vehicle. And he takes out a Slim Jim and he tries, you know, and, he, and then we couldn't get in. And he says, you ought to just throw a rock through the window. And I, and I said, well, it's my girlfriend's car. She's probably not going to like it. And he says, ah, just tell her somebody broke in. It'll be fun. Now, this is an important story because no person of color, 23 or not, New Orleans or anywhere else, would have had that experience with a police officer. And if I can't, t see, if, but by telling you that story and by all of us sort of being honest about those times that we weren't profiled, that we were treated differently, that we were advantaged in the workplace, that we were advantaged uh, in whatever realm of life, um, we, we remind ourselves that this is our story too. We remind ourselves that it's not a black and Latino and Asian and indigenous Native North American issue, that it is fundamentally about us. And the danger is that we sit back uh, too often and we don't see it as being about us. I think most people are good people. And I think that when they realize uh, at a deep level that they are directly or indirectly implicated in the suffering of other people, um, that most, not all, but most are capable of coming to the forefront of a struggle to change that. But if you don't see that you're implicated in it, it just becomes one of those things that you cluck your tongue about, you think about every few months, maybe every few years, so that's it. Thank you very much.
We are uh, about to finish the last comment we're going to have is actually from uh, Carol Simpson, who I talked about earlier, uh, one of the uh, legendary African-American uh, journalists. And we only have one question and comment, uh, and then we're going to excuse our publishers, our authors, the people who are going to be signing books, Professor Anita Hill, Gwen Eiffel, Professor Randall Kennedy, Professor Glenn Lowry, uh, Dean Mark McPhail, Professor Elizabeth Marin, myself, uh, and Tim Wise will all be signing books uh, after these comments, and you can purchase them from <laughs> Human Bookstore. <laughs> Carol Simpson. Hi. I, um, how are you? <laughs> I am the first African-American uh, woman to anchor a major network newscast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so he called me out, and I felt I had to come up here and say something. But I want to say hi to Howard and to Gwen and Anita. Do you know that I anchored 14 hours of the Clarence Thomas hearings? <laughs> <laughs> and live to tell. <laughs> and inside my jacket of my suit, I had the button, I believe her. Uh. Little secret thing. We're not supposed to have opinions, but... <laughs> I did have one. And Doug, good to see you oh, again. Uh, this has been one of my most enjoyable days on the island this summer. This has been a fabulous day. But what I wanted to tell you all, and I want to address this to the audience. One of the things, you get upset with what the media does, okay? You don't like it. That thing with the little boy on WBBM-TV in Chicago where I began my career um, was a terrible thing. But we sit and we talk about it in our living rooms, in our bedrooms. Oh, isn't that a shame? Oh, isn't that racist? You have to take personal responsibility and call the stations. Okay? Let me tell you, there are estimated 9 million Jews in, a, in America, something like 40 million African Americans. Uh, if something happens that in the news media where it looks like a tilt against Israel, our switchboards light up like you would not believe it. When the Bosnian War was going on, the Serbs and the Albanians and the Croats, whatever we presented that they felt was unfair to their side, they called. And they called and they called and they called. And there are operators that log all the calls they get. And they pay attention. OK? Because they want eyeballs. They don't think of you as viewers. They think of you as eyeballs. And they want people looking at their programming. And if they see that a whole bunch of black people in some of these cities that are half black or majority black, uh, they are going to respond. But you all are waiting for somebody else to do it. You think there's some media literacy organization. <laughs> and you've got to do it individually. That's what counts. So I just wanted to give you that message that you can change some things. I've been so upset that there aren't any black people after in the prime time that are on the cable news shows. I've been talking about this forever. Uh, you all need to talk about it. I'm sorry Al Sharpton wasn't it. We need a journalist. We need a journalist and they're there. They're out there. But black people have to speak up and not wait for somebody else to do it. I don't know who you think is going to do it. Dr. King isn't here anymore. <laughs> you have got to do it. So you, you can make change. And I hope that's a hopeful note on which to end this fabulous program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Simpson. We thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll be here again next August, August 15, 2012. I want to thank, as you join me, in thanking this panel for their outstanding presentation today.